So let's begin on motivating developers. Who here is a business owner? Okay, one. That's it. Um, who is a team lead? Okay, about a fourth. And who is a project manager? A few more. Okay. So, um, you know, as these people, we want to motivate the developers. We want them to be productive and we want to keep them for a long time. We don't want them leaving the company. So for this, we must understand the needs and their needs vary uh, from person to person based on level and other, other things. So we, wa we want to find ways to keep them motivated, uh, but also understanding the, the differences between them so that we can find the right ways. Uh, some are common ways to motivate, others are more specific. And at the end, also, of this presentation, I would like to hear what you are doing for motivation or where you are struggling, what are the reasons you might be struggling with keeping the people motivated. Or if you yourself are a developer and don't feel motivated, it, you should tell us about it. So I'm Anna Felina, I'm a developer, a problem solver, a teacher, advisor, and I own Fulab and I organize Kung Fu. So what I want you to walk away from this presentation is um, with increased productivity for your team, I want increased happiness throughout the company. So not just for the developers, but also for the managers and everybody involved. And I want you to improve the overall cor corporate culture. And it starts with just one person bringing in a few ideas, changing the attitude slightly, and then we can, we can improve the whole culture. So I'll go through a survival kit, so some basic stuff uh, that is common to everyone. Um, understanding developers, and I, I wouldn't include the full spectrum, but I'll show you key differences between the beginners and the experts because they have different things that get to them. And then some of the things that you should avoid. So things to do and things not to do. So this advice comes from personal experience. So as a freelance and a community leader, then you know from observations uh, based on what I see around myself, uh, talking to people, you know, working with upper management, uh, understanding their concerns, but also doing workshops with developers and understanding concerns on the other side as well as reading you know, literature and studies. <clears throat> so let's start with something funny. How does the management sees developers, or at least how we think management sees developers? They see them as lazy code monkeys. Um, not always, but they're, they're hard to hire. They're hard to attract to the company. They need a lot of incentive. You need to show that you're a cool company, that you pay well, all these things. Um, so there's much demand for developers, but there isn't a lot of offer of good developers. So lots of, lots of places seeking for developers, not enough of them to fill the positions, uh, and so they're, they are increasingly hard to hire. And sometimes they seem like they're not cooperating. They you know, do things their own way, they don't follow the uh, order of the assigned tasks, so you assign tasks to them and they do things this first and then that later, so it seems like they're not, they're not, um, they're not cooperating. So you know they would uh, disagree with uh, with decisions. They would you know, forget right re reports, uh, maybe even miss meetings, and you know they they seem to work always too slowly. You know they don't meet the expectations. So we say it's going to should take three months, but then. After three months, it's not ready, and you know deadlines are missed, and then customers get sometimes angry about that, and they seem to complain about stuff all the time, and they complain about things that nobody seems to understand. It's like the developer comes to to the boss and says, "Well, I need to have SSH access." I say, what do you mean SSH? You don't need SSH. We've been doing deployments over FTP for the last ten years. Like, what, what, why are you complaining about deployment procedures? What is that? So, so there's this, and also when, whenever they quit, when they're done with it, they quit, and they don't necessarily provide reasons. You can try to have a meeting after they, uh, after they leave, and then you, you try to sit them down, but they're too stressed, or they, they don't feel like sharing this. They don't feel like having an honest conversation 
at this point. It's a conversation that should have been done before, uh, before they leave, before they're you know, at the stage where they, they're done. And so if they leave and it's not clear why exactly, then what can the manager do to avoid something like this happening in the future? You know, who, whose fault is this? And what happens? So survival kits, uh, of course, people who work at a job, they need to get paid. There, I will mention a section about volunteers, how to keep volunteers engaged. But if it is a job, then it has to be a good salary. So there was a study conducted in Quebec, Canada, and they asked what is the most important criteria for when you're looking for a job. And number one criteria was uh, money, the salary. So the salary was the most important thing in Quebec. So people said that if they are underpaid, they're not interested in the job. So this may vary from culture to culture, uh, but that pops in, uh, in other countries as well. So the idea is not necessarily to just pay more and more and you know, how much is enough. So the idea is to, to treat the question as an object on the table. So now you're discussing things, but as this question remains unanswered or is, if the salary makes the person uncomfortable, then it will stay there on the table and nothing else, not, no other conversation can go on because this is just distracting. So what you need is pay enough to get the question off the table. And now you are free to continue discussing other things like the corporate culture and the company's mission, uh, different objectives, uh, what the work is going to be about. So salary is important. Uh, it depends on the person's experience, of course. Um, but you know, people, people still have bills to pay, so this is... Uh, this is important, and it's important to address the question early in the process as well, because as long as um, the two people don't know how much it's going to cost or how much one will stand to gain, the, most of the other conversations are pretty much meaningless. So take the, the, start the conversation with what do I need to know in order to propose a salary to this person? What do I need to know? So I need to know about experience a little bit. But once you've done discussing experience, go straight to the, uh, to the salary, and then you can discuss all the other things. But that's an approach that seemed to work for me. Um, they need adapted tools, so give them those tools, and also let them pick the tools. When I say adapted tools, it means software licenses, um, if you need a professional version of this software because you have a, a built-in profiler, and that's very useful because if somebody asks you to profile an application but doesn't give you the tools, it's very frustrating. Uh, if you, you know, once again, when people complain, they say, well, we need Git, but what do you mean this CSV thing doesn't work? Or CVS, sorry. CVS doesn't work anymore? Why, why not CVS? So give them adapted tools. Allow them to move forward if they want to, to have um, you know, paid for some licenses. Um, get a better computer because the computer that they have now is too slow. It's, it's very important. It's not such a big investment. Of course, it can be big when it's company-wide, but it's not such a big investment when you think about the cost of the turnaround. Because when the person leaves, then you have to pay a recruiter, and then you have to train them all over again, and you need to get them engaged. It's also emotionally very, very costly because you have to to deal with the breakup, basically, and then you have to uh, create a relationship with an entirely new person. Um, things in some cultures that may not work, but uh, in most Western cultures, at least, um, you know, eating or drinking with colleagues makes sense. So if the boss um, regularly goes out with the employees, allows the person to get to know them or to get to know each other, everyone's concerned so that the developers can be more understanding of the constraints in the company. So if they know that the company is going through some, some changes, I don't know, they're going after a new market and they need to do something differently, they, the developers might be able to understand that. And vice versa, the, the manager will be able to understand the struggles of the developer. And just get to know them as a person, what, what's, what motivates them, what doesn't motivate them. You will get that by talking to them. And 
it, work, it works best when you talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. So not just like the whole gang or in a meeting, because nobody would say uncomfortable things or uncomfortable truths in a meeting or when too many people are around. It's something that has to be said in private. So provide them with the opportunities to say that in private. And if you are the employee, then you can suggest to go and have lunch and discuss about something very important because it's also a more comfortable setting than in the office by the coffee machine you have the stress and you're also in this environment where you feel that it's a bit more hostile and you go out to to some restaurant just across the street have lunch takes uh, half an hour or maybe one hour and then you discuss all the all the important things and the person might you know you you might understand what the person's problem is and then you'll be able to solve it and then you'll be able to move forward. Another thing that works well is paid training and conferences and they can be either exterior or interior. Uh, in any case it's both fun, you know, it changes the routine, something new. You just turn off the monitor, stop thinking for a moment, go out there, learn things, meet new people. The developers really enjoy going to conferences as you know I can see here we have but over a thousand people maybe. Um, and it makes them better at their job as well. And not just, it's, it's not just something that pleases the person receiving the work, not just the boss, but also the person is himself when, um, so if I am more productive, I feel better about myself. And so that keeps me motivated as well. If I know that I'm now more knowledgeable than I was two days ago, then I feel good and I want to stay working at this company because I want to keep going to conferences maybe once or twice a year. Um, some of the type of training that you can get are in-house, so you can even get like a one-day or two-day workshop, so a big sprint, and then you learn a, a new framework, for example, or you, you learn about uh, testing strategies and, and things like that. Um, there's also coaching that you can have, which is... Um, depending on the arrangement, you can have a person coming in once a week, so a, an expert that comes in once a week, and then helps people, you know, gets them unstuck, basically. So when they are stuck on a problem, they, they solve this problem for them, they bring in a fresh perspective, um, and that is very helpful, and that keeps people motivated. And also meeting new people is, is always great. Another thing is sharing business objectives. And I will go more in detail later on about that. It's very important to not keep them just on the upper management level. The objectives are something that every single person in the company needs to know. So the management comes up with these objectives, but you know the designer, everyone, the, the integrator, the, the, the sysadmin, sys the developer, everybody needs to know what the objectives are. Otherwise, the work makes no sense. And I'll go into more detail in some time. So let's talk about the beginners. So beginners often, doesn't apply to everyone, but often they're afraid that people will think that they're not uh, very good developers. It's called sometimes the imposter syndrome. So they might be very good, but they're new to this. Maybe it's their first job and they want to make an impression. And if they want to make an impression, they try to prove themselves they will be you know, afraid to ask questions or they will be sensitive to criticism. So the criticism has to, um, has to be constructive. So things like don't judge. So when you, when you do code reviews and the person is, is a beginner, what you can do is, and in general, when you do code reviews, you shouldn't worry about the little things. So, oh, you could have done it this, this way because that's how I would have done it. Don't be too critical because if the code makes sense, makes sense. Just leave the details out of it. Don't worry about the small things. So if there's something major, like you, you see that, okay, this is a problem. I don't know, you, um, you're not using prepared statements for your SQL. Well, that may be a problem. So you show them how to do things. So show them new tools, show them new, uh, show them best practices, show them new technologies. Teach them. They will appreciate that. Uh, check on their progress often because they might be afraid to ask questions. And I've seen that a lot. I've been, uh, even before I was a freelance, I was working at a company, and I was often assigned people to train and 
Like, for example, somebody was a Java developer and I would train him on another language. Um, or just integrators coming in and, and I would have to follow them, make sure that they, they, there's progress, that they get you know, into the project and understand how to do things. And I would, at first, would just let her work. And then I, I, I decided to go check up on her and saw, noticed that she was struggling with something. She had an obstacle, but she didn't come to me to ask a question. And I, was, and I started thinking, and I was maybe like 20 at the time, and I started thinking, why is, this, why is it that this person doesn't come to me with questions? Well, maybe because she's afraid to look like she doesn't know things. And that makes sense. We all feel that at some point we are afraid to ask questions, uh, depending on the people around us or depending on our experience. But at first, it's very hard. And so I, I checked on her progress, and I, I, uh, I helped her out. And then I decided to check up on her more often. And every time I, I came to her, she had questions but she wouldn't come to ask them. So it's good to actually go and, and get those questions out of them, invite them to ask those questions, not just sit and expect them to come to you. So go to them and ask them, do you have any questions? Is everything all right? Can I help you with something? And that's fine. Don't overdo it because you know, that would feel like micromanagement or that you don't trust them. But you know, from time to time, maybe at first, in the first few days, you can come maybe two, three times a day and then then you can come less often. And then they might start coming to you because now the trust relationship is established and they know that they won't be judged by you, so they'll just come and ask the questions themselves. Um, these people also, um, they often need a list of tasks. So planning, you know, they don't understand the project as a whole, whether they're beginners on this specific project or just in general. They might not know how to plan things in a, in a good way or might not appreciated being forced to make those hard decisions because they might be very hard decisions. So be clear with a list of tasks. Just say, do this, do that, do that. Um, don't, don't be too specific in the sense that don't tell them how to do it exactly, but just tell them things and prioritize a little bit. Um, make sure that it's, it's pretty clear what is expected of them, what they should provide, what is the deliverable at the end of the day, for example. So do the plan, some of the planning for them and assign tasks that are appropriate to the skills. And when I say appropriate, I always like to give people a, uh, something that is just a little bit challenging. Because it's, if it's too easy, it's not interesting. But if there's just a little bit of challenge, they will get interested in the problem. But it's something that they should be able to solve. If you give them something that is much up higher than their level, then they will not be able to solve it. They'll be frustrated. They will close because they will feel like they're, you know, they won't ask questions because now they will feel uh, inadequate for the job and they will start, start worried that they, they might not stay there. So, you know, all these emotions can go through their heads. So you don't want that. Um, so assign, evaluate their skill level. Uh, start small. If you see that they get it done too quickly, then increase the difficulty progressively until you reach a point where they have to solve a puzzle, basically where they have to, uh, they have some sort of a challenge. Um, and you know, they need approval, they need to know that what they have produced is good enough for you. So is, the, is what I just completed, is this good? So here's my deliverable, and make sure to validate the, del the deliverable matches your expectations quickly, so that they would know, okay, well this is, this is how I'm supposed to do things, I can continue in this direction now. Otherwise, they're stuck waiting on uh, basically a, a green light to move forward. So uh, validate their work quickly and help them with some of the more difficult decisions. And from time to time, you can say, good job. And that also helps. That helps with everyone. So the experts are a bit different. Although, once again, it depends on, on the person. But experts, I've noticed that they generally like to move fast. They, they are skilled. And they appreciate being productive. They appreciate the skill that they have and the clean code that they can create. So they want to be able to move fast. And for that, you need to give them autonomy. And in order to give them autonomy, you need to trust them. So examples of how you can give them more autonomy is decide whether they should do unit tests or not, for example. If, if they say that they need it, then they need it. It's a technical decision. 
it's like whether they should debug something or not. That is entirely up to them. You shouldn't have to micromanage them. So leave the technical decisions to them, leave some of the time management to them as well, because they know themselves and they know the job, and they can, they can make something that, uh, they can prioritize things in a way that makes more sense, perhaps, and they can add what you, you feel like seemingly unimportant tasks, but they might be very important. So for example, um, at a job I had, I was doing a, uh, so my, my, my task was for a period to uh, take applications from that other people wrote in other countries and integrate them into our platform. And, and it was always different. I, and I, some, some of the code was really, really bad. And some of the code was really good. So I made a, a, basically a checklist of things to look for that will give me a hint uh, as of for the quality of code. So is this going to be code that's easy to integrate or not? And that, for me, was very important because it would have helped me make my estimates more precise. Because sometimes it would take four days to integrate, and something equivalent but written in a, in a clean way would take me 15 minutes. And that's not no joke. It happened to me once that I estimated four days, and then it took me four, uh, 15 minutes. And then the project manager came to me and said, well, you said it's going to take four days. Well, I didn't know it was going to be that good. <laughs> you know, so some code written in Romania was just amazing. It was just configured a few things in XML and just plugged it in, and it was working perfectly flawlessly. It's great. I couldn't have known that. So because they were worried about inaccurate, um, um, inaccurate estimates, I created this list for myself. And it only took me 20 minutes to do the list, but then the project manager looked over my shoulder and said, what, what are you doing? I said what I was doing, but you're not supposed to do that. What do you mean? This is necessary for me to do my job better in order to meet your own expectations. And so we had an argument about that. And, and that's not a good thing, because you know I was I was the expert and I knew what I was doing. And someone coming to me and saying, "Well, this part of your so you're building this I don't know skyscraper," and somebody comes and pulls out a brick and says, "Well, you don't need this brick." What do you mean? I know I need it there. I put it there for a reason. So that's pretty much it. And then give them a Padawan, not a minion, but a Padawan. There's a, a difference, <laughs> okay? It's not somebody to just offload all the crappy tasks. It's somebody who will learn from them, and you know they will always be, you know, they will be able to bounce ideas. The the more junior person will be able to learn from the more experienced person, and then also they will be able to split the work because once again I said you have to assign tasks proportionate to the skill level. So then now all these tasks can be split, and whatever the uh, the more um, the, the the least experienced person cannot accomplish because this is too complicated, we'll give them to this and let the expert handle the stuff that the other cannot do. So it's not about what work is boring or not. It's more about what is the difficulty or what is the skill level required to accomplish that job. Um, cut on a communication intermediaries if you can. I, I personally like to speak directly to the person that has the information I need rather than emailing a person who will email a person and then maybe two, two days later I get an answer that I no longer need because by the time I found the answer myself. But it would have been more efficient if I had a direct channel of communication to the person who knows how this other system that we're integrating into works and then we'll be able to complete the job much more quickly. And of course, fewer meetings, uh, always fewer meetings. Um, it's, yeah, it's really obvious, you know, death by PowerPoint and stuff. Everybody knows it. <laughs> so I don't need to spend any time on that. Uh, the experts are very good at putting out fires. They are very skilled. They can crank it up to 11 and just come up with a miracle solution. They can do that. Uh, but the problem is that if you're always in a state of emergency, you will drain them physically and emotionally, and especially if you do overtime, like staying on the weekend or staying a few extra hours. This is time that you take away from their family, uh, from their friends, or from whatever else they feel like doing on their own time. If they want to play video games, 
that's fine because then they will be more uh, more comfortable going to work next day because you know they played the a game it, it felt good and now they are more relaxed in order and more productive now to do the job so don't take away their personal time just because they're single and have no kids it means nothing it's their time so no perpetual state uh, of emergency plan your things so that you wouldn't get into that state of emergency it's important i know it's hard to foresee things but since you know that there will be unforeseeable things just add a buffer it's better to promise a later date and deliver early than to promise a very strict date and then having to squeeze the rest when you feel like you are not going to meet the deadline. Because squeezing it and, and then, oh, well, we managed to squeeze it last time. Let's put our deadlines um, at this place again. And now you're always pushing them, and then they have a burnout. And I have seen that in companies many times where um, you know, CTOs and team leads, they, they get a burnout. So now we talked about you know, the, the, the general advice. Um, now, what else drives people? Because sometimes people are volunteers. They're not always at a paid job. So what do you do if you organize, I don't know, game designers uh, across different countries and you're trying to do some indie game? So what, what drives people? Why would, they, why would people organize FrostCon here? So let me give you an example. Try to unscramble this word, shout it. What's the word? Yes, you got it. Now my question is, why did you why did you unscramble this? Why did you do it? Because it's fun? Was it fun? Do you feel like you needed to prove that you could do it? And I don't mean to judge, but it's it feels good to solve a problem and show people that hey, I know something, I can do it, even if it's a simple one. And this this is a, a, the, at the core of what drives us. Now let's get into the more scientific approach to motivation. So the dictionary definition is motivation is the reason to do something, which is fairly obvious. Wikipedia, and please don't misread the word, psychological feature that arouses an organism. <laughs> I was practicing not to make the mistake, to act towards a desired goal. <laughs> yeah, two words that are hard to not to associate. So it is basically we do it because we want to do it because it gives us some sort of pleasure and work should be about pleasure if there is no pleasure in the work then we won't be able to keep it up for a long time it's like when you say i need to exercise well you can go to the gym but i don't like going to the gym i won't be able to stay there for more than 10 minutes i'll be bored it it doesn't drive me i i, I get no pleasure from that i get pleasure from other activities like skiing that really motivates me. I would go on a ski trip. I would pack and I go to South America and I would ski uh, on the mountains there, on the volcanoes. I would do that. But I wouldn't go to the gym next door. So every person has something different that motivates them, that they, they enjoy doing. So they do things. Basically, motivation is the why. Why am I doing it? Because of something or in order to achieve something. So why am I doing this? Well, the, the thing is because of usually is a consequence. So I'm doing my taxes because otherwise I'll get a penalty and you know people will come and take my TV or, or my computer or my car. If you're doing something because of, you're not really motivated. You're forced to do it. But if you're doing it in order to achieve something, then you will be, you'll be able to keep people motivated. So just ask those questions about the things you do at work. And are you doing them because of something or in order to something? And if the, 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 the answer is the first, then something is wrong. If the answer is the second, I mean, it's a general rule of thumb, but it gives you an idea. Maybe you, know, you should question what you're doing or rather why you're doing it. So what you need is clearly defined goals. So we are doing it because of, you know, or in order to achieve some goal. And this goal has to be measurable because you want to know, well, I have achieved it. It's like when you run a marathon, 
you won't run past the finish line. Okay, here's the finish line. I got it. Now I feel great. You don't need to do like one extra mile. There's no point really. So it has to be measurable. You have to know when you have achieved something. And it has to be achievable, something that you are actually capable of achieving, not some something that, well, some people dream big, right? They feel like um, interstellar travel is you know, possible, so they are working towards that, and that's great. Some people don't think that it is believable, so they work towards smaller things like, I don't know, reducing CO2 emissions by you know, building a better cloud you know, that's scalable so that machines turn off when you don't need them. And for really big centers, that means a lot of CO2, and that is bad for the environment. So whatever gets to you. And these goals have to be shared with everyone. I already stressed that. I'll stress it again. Share the goals with everyone at the company. Everybody has to know. Don't leave them in the dark and just give them tasks and, or um, technical specifications. Give them actual goals so that they can sometimes come to you and say, well, I have this feature to implement, but I fail to see how it reaches this goal. Then you, you, you think about it, and indeed, this is just a feature for the sake of being a feature. It's not really necessary. And then, by the way, I apply this to, to my backlog. I no longer have a backlog because I just am able to complete tasks so quickly that they don't even get to the backlog because I realized that 80% of all of that was not achieving any of the goals that I set for myself or that, that the client set for the project. So it reduces the, the, the scope and you can achieve goals, it's better for the company, but it also makes people feel good because I'm not implementing some reporting system that is not going to be used by anyone. It's, if I'm producing work that is not useful, I don't feel like I'm doing anything important. I'm, I'm not valued, I'm wasting my time. But if I'm doing something and I can clearly see how it gets me closer to the goal and by how much, then I will be motivated to do that task. And you know, go with, um, you know, me so measurable, you have uh, a, dead, um, sorry, a milestone or like a finish line, but then you have those smaller milestones um, and they are small wins. So celebrate the small wins. I had a button at my office where I would press and it would say that was easy. So every time I was able to do something um, and it wasn't too difficult or just achieved something that I felt like, okay, I've, I have a win, you know, hashtag win. Okay, so I just press this button and everybody at the office knows that I just did something cool, you know? And, and that mo in turn motivates them because, hey, someone is, you know, just had a win. Yeah, now I have to win, you know? I have to do something cool. I have to finish a task, you know? I have to accomplish a goal now. It's, it's viral. And that's how you change the culture, by showing, you know, success inspires more success. So, what else drives people? Um, you know, gratification. So that's basically whether you identify with the goals that have been set forward. So if I'm not interested in, in this goal, then, well, so for example, if you're not interested in increasing the conversion rate for, for some, some business, then it doesn't matter you know, how clear are the goals and how they've been communicated. It doesn't matter because it's not something that you want to achieve. But if it's something that you want to achieve, and that's, that's part of the hiring process, that's why the goals have to be, be set forward very early in the process. Mission statement, goals. <laughs> that's basically how it goes. And then you hire people who identify with those goals. If they don't identify, then you will have motivation problems. You might hire them anyway, but just know that motivation might be a problem because this is not that in, nothing that interests them. They are only here for, to do the job because maybe they need a job. Uh, at the moment, but whenever they have a better opportunity to do something that they are going to identify with, like for example, for me, I used to build video games for kids, and my son was beta testing them, so it was just awesome, you know, building video games that my kid can play. It's nice. So I was identifying with that, and that's what drove me um, to perform there. Uh, so talent is about <clears throat> using using your talent. So if I give you a task that is too easy, then you're not really using your talent. And this is why, um, what I said previously, you have to assign tasks or problems appropriate to the skill level so that you give people a little bit of a challenge. And recognition that's pretty straightforward. 
you know, you recognize the work, people need to feel like they've contributed and that people appreciate that they have contributed. And it's not just saying, oh, thank you. It's not about giving gifts necessarily. It's just about saying, oh, you wrote that. This is really good. You wrote this piece of code. That's very good. Just, just give them also credit for writing that. Just whenever somebody asks, oh, who wrote this? It's very good. Said, oh, this guy wrote it. So, yeah. So this guy is now, if this guy's in the room, we'll feel very good because somebody has recognized that what they did is good. And some of the things to avoid, how am I doing on time? Thank you. So things to avoid is having unclear objectives, something that is you know, very vague and that you don't know, <clears throat> you don't know whether you have achieved them or not, <clears throat> something that makes no sense. Last minute changes, you know, requirement changes, that's always annoying. Um, you, of course, the scope can change, uh, sorry, not the scope, but whatever. The, the requirements can change, but you shouldn't do them at the last minute. You should plan your things ahead once again so that you don't have to rush and squeeze things into a shorter period of time. Arbitrary deadlines, you know, once again, check with the team lead, because the team lead is the one that is closest to the developers, and the team lead knows both the project, so the complexity of the code, where the weak spots are in the code. So if you ask them, well, this feature, well, the, the, the team lead knows that the feature is in this part of the code, and oh, that's going to be tricky because you might think it's something that takes five minutes, but no, that is, requires some refactoring because it's not going to support this approach at all. So this is actually going to take 20 hours. So only the team lead would know that, or other developers. But the team lead would also know all the developers and their skills, <clears throat> and that together will give you a more accurate estimate of um, what the team can accomplish. So over time, be careful about that. Don't overwork them. They'll be tired. They will be less productive. And they won't really be uh, motivated to come back to work again on the next day. Uh, weekend social events. Um, so social events are great. But I found that when you organize them on the weekends, you take time away from the people's families. And not just because you know they have families and kids, but just take them away from, I don't know, maybe they're, they have a raid night, you know, and, and wow, and they need that time. It's important to them. You don't know. So don't take them away from that time. It's, it's, it looks like it would cost you a lot to have a full day paid where people go and do some go-karts or paintball. It would seem expensive to do this during a work day, but it's not because people will be better, you know, better rested, they will bond, you know, and they don't, you don't take them away from their other activities. So it is worth it. So for example, when I go on a three week vacation and skiing, when I come back in the next two weeks, I can accomplish enough work for two months. So basically what I would normally accomplish in two months, I do it in two weeks. So those three weeks of vacation were more than worth it because I got more product, so much more productivity out of it. So imagine if you, a few times a year you take this one day and go um, do some activities, uh, hiking, whatever, whatever people enjoy, and uh, that will work great. Also good if the activities are not organized or at least not proposed by the management, but rather by people. So you can have, I've seen companies that had a, the fund committee. So it's the fund committee is responsible for throwing the birthday, birthday parties and organizing all these outings. And you know, the, on Thursday, sometimes they would go drinking or something. So there's a, a team of people give the power to the, uh, to the people in the company and not just the board of directors that says, well, yeah, we're going to have paintball on that day. And it's, it, it sounds great, but coming from the top, it once again feels like it's not their decision. Um, bad chairs, and that is really strange, but I cannot stress how uncomfortable chairs are at most companies. And because when I go consulting and I have to sit in a chair, like conference rooms generally have good chairs, but then you go sit at a desk and it's little chairs, uh, sometimes chairs that don't even pivot or anything that you cannot adjust the height, like, um, you know, like garden chairs almost. 
but not most, not most, but I've seen that. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's just an extra $100. Uh, I speak in dollars, I'm from Canada, so just an extra 100 and it's, it can make all the difference because the chair, I mean, it's already unhealthy to be sitting all day. Might as well make it a little less painful on the back. So invest in a good chair. So, for example, this is the chair I use. It cost me $200, so just like instead of having a, a really bad $100 chair, I have a really, really good $200 chair. And that's like yeah, IKEA, the Marcus model, so write it down. Okay? <laughs> it's very important. Um, gadgets, you know, it's just some fun stuff. So this is Matthew Weir Finney. Um, he works with Zens, uh, so he does a, a PHP framework. It's called Zen Framework. And it was at a conference, and you know, yeah, the, it was from 2009. And so they had these Nerf guns on stage, and they would shoot the audience. It was fun. But imagine those things in the company. You know, you have cool name badges that you give to people, like a, a nice, I don't know, magnetic insignia. You know, that you can put uh, so it, they feel connected with the company. You show your appreciation. Nerf guns, you know, big screen, retro gaming, whatever you can come up with. Once again, the fun committee can take care of that, so it's not like it's too much effort. Just tell people, well, you have a budget on thinkgeek.com. And, you know, just buy some toys and spice things up at the office. <laughs> yeah, spice things up at the office with toys. <clears throat> I didn't say anything. You thought stuff, you know? All right, so, so this, is, this is, yeah, it's a pretty cheap way to do things, um, but it works and it's fun, and as long as you give people the power to make their own decisions about what is fun for them, you'll be able to keep them motivated for a long time. And I've seen companies where, you know, with proper training, you know, going to conferences and all that stuff, with having clear goals, uh, having a good environment. Some people are staying for like 17, 20 years at a company. But this is great. This is what you want. You want people to stay there and connect with the company. You don't want to retrain a person every six months because they get a burnout or they get frustrated with the methodology or something. So yeah, just use common sense and some of these tips and you'll be fine. And uh, my name is Anna Felina. Once again, I do development in PHP and JavaScript. I fix bugs and I uh, solve performance issues. I do workshops on testing and APIs and stuff advise on testing strategies, and I do a lot of legacy code refactoring. So yeah, call me. And I will tweet those slides. Thank you. So now I want to hear from you. How do you feel about your work, or how do you feel about your employees? Nerf guns are great. Nerf guns are great. OK. Anyone? Any ideas that you want to add to this? Yeah, so the person here proposes hackathons as a great means to motivate developers. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Okay, so how do I feel about open space versus cubicles with, uh, versus closed offices? Um, it really depends on the person. Some people enjoy open, open spaces and maybe having a mix. Cubicles, not so much maybe. Um, well, once again, I think it depends on the person. But some people, they like to be you know, distraction free. They don't like uh, people walking through and, and looking always at their desk. Uh, so some people, they just don't like the noise. Uh, other people, they like to talk a lot. I know that I personally don't like open spaces because it's too noisy and it's work that requires concentration. And there's a reason why I do most of my best work early in the morning or very late at night, because it's dead quiet. There's no, no sound, maybe a toad you know, outside, but that's all. That's all I can hear. And, and I, I love that because there's no, no kids running in the house at that time. There's no, no noise anywhere. Nobody's mowing their lawn. So I work from home. And I like that. I, I wouldn't trade that for an open space. Yes? OK, 
Okay, so how to implement that? Okay, so the difference between uh, distributed teams and working in the same office, uh, how to implement those tips. Um, some of these, the goals work, you know, with everyone. Uh, when I do distributed teams, I like to have a some sort of face time. It's sometimes hard with the time zones, but having face time. Uh, worst case, having two periods because you know sometimes you have people in North America, you have people in uh, Europe, you have people in the Middle East, and then you have people in Australia. You just cannot find a time where it works for everyone. So splitting it into two, I guess, work sessions where you have some sort of face time. That's helpful so that people know that if they log in at that time, there will be somebody to answer the question. And that can be done either via IRC or similar tools. Um, FaceTime, is, personally, I feel that FaceTime is not required. Um, it, well, not FaceTime, but being face-to-face -face with somebody uh, in person is not required. It's something that is required in the beginning in order to establish a trust relationship. Um, and just, just put a face, I guess, a real face on the, on the name. And from there, you know, you can use um, Skype or other uh, voice communications also work very well. Uh, I like uh, talking, you know, with my voice instead of chatting. Uh, so I, yeah, I like that. Okay, so what's the key difference between people who get paid and people who don't get paid, volunteers? Well, obviously it's the money. It's, it's because in some countries you would see that it's the number one reason for people to do something. Uh, at least so they say, so they think. Uh, it is an important aspect. So if, if they are not getting paid for their work, they must have another source of revenue somewhere else. So why are they going this extra effort? they're going this extra effort because they want to accomplish something that they would otherwise not accomplish in their regular job or whichever the uh, source of financial income is. But still, they need to identify with the goals and that's very important. If they're doing it for the wrong reasons, like for example, if they're doing something, well, it also depends what kind of volunteering we're talking about. Maybe some volunteering, the purpose is also to uh, maybe get your name out and things like that. Uh, for some or, uh, organizations, that would be considered the wrong reason. You should do it because you want to accomplish that specific goal. Um, so it would really depend. But once again, the goals are at the core of it. Yeah. Yes? So, so we're talking about productivity phases where it makes things hard to plan because a person would be extremely productive for a short period and then no productivity. But maybe it's not a motivation issue. So you're making an assumption. Maybe it's not a motivation issue. Maybe it's just the way the person operates. Maybe the person is thinking, taking this time to think and plan. And I do that a lot. I would turn off the monitor and just go sit somewhere else and sometimes even go outside the house because I don't want to be in the same place where I am. I produce because the area where I produce, I have tunnel vision, which I need in order to be very effective and move forward quickly. But when I need to be creative and, and think and plan and find the best way to approach the problem, I do it on a long, uh, for a longer period of time. So I have actually a similar, a similar cycle where I would take a long time to plan, 
but the execution is really quick. And overall, uh, but maybe try to find out why the person has these phases. Just have a discussion. Yeah, so the, the, the follow-up question is that um, basically the person's cycles are disruptive to the team because the team, has, uh, the team depends on the person to produce something. Well, that's different. If the person, the person should be aware that he's being disruptive to the work. And I guess, I mean, it's hard to say because I cannot, I, you need to analyze the person, the person's emotions and behavior and have a conversation with the person uh, and ask the person what can we do and just expose the problem and say, well, here you have these cycles and just like you told me, here you have these cycles and it doesn't work for me because then people depend on you and that you know, throws off my schedule. Is there anything we can do that is you know, mutually agreeable that works for you and works for me? Is there anything I can do? Is there anything possibly wrong? But don't, don't ask the person, is there a problem we need to address? Don't focus on the problem, focus about the solution. So try talking about the solutions without necessarily, so ex expose the problem briefly and just go straight for asking for the solutions, not explaining the problem. Okay? Yes. Okay, so it's basically a situation where you cannot steer the person away from the critical path, as you said, uh, because the person is needed in the core, needed, needed to be where the person is right now. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> motivated. <laughs> So the, the question, or rather the problem exposed here, is somebody who is very motivated but works too much and is um, at work early, sometimes online at very, very late hours uh, at night, so, and people are concerned that this person might have a burnout. So it is normal to be concerned for the person. Um, obviously, it's not a motivational problem. Um, but the person might have the reasons to do that. Um, but it has to, I guess it has to come from inside. You can, you can talk about it as a friend and try to understand um, 
you know, why the person is doing these things, why the person doesn't take a break. But, you know, most people, they have interests, you know, they, they do something else to get their way out of it because they understand the importance. Uh, but it has to come from the ins inside because if the person doesn't want to change that, um, I guess, not personality trait, but doesn't want to change this, this aspect of their life, then it, you cannot just impose it or, or even if you suggest that the person does something else, uh, the person might not be receptive to that. So just have a conversation, and an honest conversation, and see here, you know, I'm, I'm concerned. Don't talk about other people, just talk about you, how you feel, because if you bring other people's opinions into it without the other people present, it will be intimidating. So just say how you feel, like I feel concerned about you because of that, uh, and maybe try to understand and come up with a solution, but it will be a very creative one. I hope you do. Wait, the problem is um, that it affects others and you're afraid that others will be less motivated or are they less motivated because of others? Okay, so there's uh, uneven motivation in a company and some people are more motivated, others they leave early, they don't care as much. Um, I don't think that people that are, moti because motivation comes mostly from the inside. You can, you can steer things a little bit, you can facilitate by providing a more suitable environment, but the motivation comes from inside. I will always be motivated, no matter what people around me do. <laughs> so I, I don't see myself leaving early because other people are leaving early. I mean, some behavior might be contagious, but I'm pretty sure these people will remain productive despite having others leave early. Um, I don't know, maybe there's a, a, the team lead has to show a good example and uh, propose, uh, give the pace. So the, if the team lead is motivated, so that should, that should be pretty good for, for the rest of the team. But you, you cannot necessarily bring everyone to the same level of motivation because obviously people are different and they identify with the goals differently. Um, I don't, I don't see the solution, but I don't quite see the problem either because people are just different and um, people will not become something else because they see someone do something. So for example, if I see someone steal, I will not become a thief because that's just not me. I cannot be dishonest even when I see people around me in the business being dishonest. I, I just cannot do that. I cannot say, I cannot say, yeah, I know this, but I actually don't. I can't say that. Of course, you're right, but I'm talking about situations where, for example, uh, one person says, yeah, if uh, there's a problem in the project, I, uh, I'm available to, uh, to work late in emergencies, and fix the problem for the team, but if they do this often, and they never see the others doing it uh, as well, then they might not. Okay, so you're saying that people that are going the extra mile might see that others are not doing it, and so they won't see the, the point of volunteering for extra hours or whatever. Um, once again, the, the key word is might, they might, but I don't think they will really, it, it sh at least they shouldn't logically, because that's how uh, the humans are. They, they do things because they feel attached to the company, they want to help, they will always help. So if others are not helping, then, I mean, they might, they might feel that they are maybe in a, um, inappropriately compensated. So maybe you can encourage by doing something good for them. Uh, don't punish the others, obviously, but try to encourage them and, and show that you appreciate what they're doing. And as long as you have this appreciation, just just you know, having this good relationship with them and, and saying that you appreciate what they do, um, and that I would say friendship is it should be enough for for people because they're already motivated.
All right, so you're saying that you could help gratify with maybe money bonuses. Uh, I would say maybe that works in some situations, and I, I agree that you should give some sort of compensation uh, for that, um, but it doesn't have to be money directly. It can be, I don't know, uh, some game tickets, uh, you know, going to a concert, things like that. Just, uh, just little things that are not necessarily just money, because money is, you know, it's like a resource that you can move from one place to another, and it kind of disappears. But those tickets, when you go to this game, you will appreciate the person will appreciate the game and say, "Hey, I want not necessarily I want to do more of that, but I'll keep doing that because somebody appreciates what I do and is showing me clearly, not just uh, it's like a, it's like this thing between that they say man and woman, you know, the the man doesn't say I love you because he says, well, but you know I love you, right? But no, she has to hear the words. I mean, it's a stereotype, but right. It's just to say that some people, they, they need that somebody to tell them that they are appreciated or shown with actions that they are appreciated. Uh, depends on the person. Uh, but as long as the motivation doesn't decline in others, I wouldn't stress too much. You can do that if you feel like it. You can, you can give them something. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Yes? All right, so what he's saying is that uh, motivating with money doesn't quite work for creative work. And I agree. Once again, the, if you give person the freedom to, well, first of all, goals that they can identify with and freedom to uh, spend time on creating new things and maybe even time to, as you said, to work on something, just create, do some creative work, um, think of ways to improve the company. Um, these things, they are very encouraging and may, may keep people motivated. Yeah. yeah, I think I'm out of time, so thank you very much. <laughs>